Hallelujah. That's one of my favorite James Block songs right there, you guys. That comes straight from prophecy. That is a prophecy about the remnant of the end times. He's going to bring us from the dry bone. He's going to bring us back to life. And he does it with the breath of Yah. That word in Hawaii or Hawaiian is hamakua. Hamakua means breath of God or breath of Yah. And that's what he's going to do. He's going to breathe life back in us. You guys, I know that you've been waiting on codes. You've been, I mean, this is the code searcher. This is what I do. And I've been focused a lot on the calendar. But you guys, it is what you was put on my, my heart and my spirit. And this time is this is the most critical. On the other side of the salvation message, of course, this is the most critical teaching in the end times for today. This reconnects us to the Father. All this was taken away from us in Christianity. It was, you guys. We were given false feast and false Shabbats and false names. All these things were done to us. And now he's revealing this in this time and bringing us back. He's breathing life into those dry bones. And what was laid on my heart, you guys, about this end time rem uh, remnant, this revelation. About the stalls in the field. Remember that when I told you he showed me the stalls in the field like wheat and all these Hebrew communities all around the world that were clustered together waiting on the final harvest. He's going to pour out his spirit upon all that flesh. And the same thing we saw what happened in the upper room in Acts 2 is going to happen again and it's going to happen on a greater scale, you guys. He's going to pour out his spirit. You're going to have power. You're going to have power. You're going to be able to call angels and call on Yahuwah to do mighty things, you guys. Yeshua told us you're going to do greater. You're going to do greater. And so that's what it's all about. So make no mistake about it. I am working on codes. I'm working on one in particular about this hidden day called Shavuot, which has been hidden from us. And you guys, make no mistake about it. Listen, if you are if you are so willing to believe that the earth is flat, that we've all been lied to, and you know that the name's been taken from us, and that and the Shabbat has been obscured, it is not Saturday. That's what this video is about. Then, is it too far for us to believe that they would obscure? And when I say they, I mean the evil ones. The most important day of Yahuwah, which is Shavuot, you guys. All of his feasts are important. But I personally believe that his favorite, because this is when he gave us the law and this is when he gave us the Holy Spirit, is in fact Shavuot, and it's a hidden day. It happens on a new moon. At the new, it's a Shabbat and a new moon right at that time. It's at the end of a month. It's at the end of the fourth month going into the fifth month. I have proven that to you with scriptures showing you that it's impossible. It's impossible, you guys. I've given you two witnesses and loads of scriptures showing you that you can't have wheat and wine at the same time in the third month. The only way that you can have new wine is if it is a grape harvest. And then there's a seven-day period between seven and 14 days where you can technically have what is called new wine, which has high sugar content, and it's very smooth. That's what was being accused of those people in the upper room, that they were drunk on new wine. This places that point in the summer, you guys. So where did it all go awry? How did all this confusion come about? Well, I'm going to present to you, well, I'm going to mirror another excellent video from Miss Barbara and uh, Brother Peter from Lunar Sabbath on that very thing, how Hillel was forced to change the calendar. And it didn't happen in the time of Yeshua or before Yeshua, you guys. Yeshua wasn't on a Saturday Shabbat. Are you serious? Really? As a Hebrew, do you really think that he was going to go with a Bulgarian calendar, Roman calendar, and his his feast days and Shabbat are just going to conveniently fall on Saturdays. And it's a continual count. 
no regard for the new moon at all, like the scripture commands us to do, is to mark the new month, the new moon. You really think that Yahuwah is going to have his people on a Pope Gregorian papal calendar? No, it's not. It's biblical. It's a biblical agricultural calendar, you guys. And so in this video, I'm going to present to you a very excellent teaching from Miss Barbara and Brother Peter about uh, Hillel II and how the calendar became changed. And, and if, if you have an interest in knowing this truth, and I know many of you do, I, I see your, your, your emails and your messages about this topic. I'm currently talking to someone now who I just engaged on Facebook about the, the Sabbath, and he has no idea. And I love I love this brother, but he, he's he's misinformed. He really believes that the Shabbat is Saturday. He well, he came from Sunday. He comes from a Greek Orthodox understanding, and he believes that Saturday is the Shabbat. And I'm asking you who to open his eyes up and to reveal to him the truth about the Shabbat, given right here at, at Sinai. You guys. Please stay tuned for this teaching and please comment. Please share this video and go subscribe to Lunar Sabbath. Join that group on Facebook. Tons of learning there. Tons of learning. So let me get this started for you guys. You don't want to miss this. This is excellent teaching. If you are into historical fact and biblical truths, this is the video for you. Shalom to you. Please enjoy this. Let me get it started for you. and friends has gathered together and I just want to welcome you if you're listening to the recording um, uh, we have a website we would love for you to go to it it has a lot more information about the Creator Sabbath there's a lot of articles there videos there and if you want to join us for fellowship and worship you can scroll down to the bottom of the events page and you'll see um, the dates and times that we gather in the website is lunarsabbathday.com. So uh, today our discussion about the original timekeeping system is uh, about the Hillel II calendar. And uh, Brother Pete said he'd help me read today, and I'm Barbara, your host today. So um, here we go. I'm thankful for everyone is here. Uh, okay, the title is, why was the Hebrew calendar fixed by Hillel II? And uh, another part is why was that ancient biblical calendar outlawed? Well, um, Constantine, uh, we'll just review a little bit. Uh, Constantine accomplished three things, the, the ripple effects of which resound to this day. He standardized the planetary week of seven days, making Dias Sola Sunday the first day of the week, Dias Saturni Saturday the last day of the week. The second thing, he exalted Easter and guaranteed that the true Passover and the pagan Easter would never fall on the same day. And three, he exalted Dias Solas as a day of worship for both pagans and Christians. And I'm hearing a little background noise. I, if you can mute your phone, that would be good. You could push star six. So, uh, okay, here's the result of what happened with Constantine. The result of Constantine's ecumenis ecumenism was swiftly felt. All who refused to give up the use of the biblical calendar for calculating Passover felt the heavy hand of oppression fall on them. Constantine's son, Constantinus, Constantinus, took his father's act one step further and outlawed the use of the biblical calendar for Jews as well. Historian David Sidersky observed, it was no more possible under Constance to apply the old calendar. That's David Sidersky, Sidersky Astronomical Origins of Jewish Chronology, page 651, emphasis supplied. 
Yeah, thank you, Brother Pete. And I'll just mention I have all these links down below for all these um, uh, references. So we don't have to read them today. And those that are watching on the YouTube can find them below. And those of you that are here can will get it in your recording link, the article. So uh, we'll kind of not have to make you read all these uh, references. Let me just say, you guys, while she's on this graphic right here, how this makes a lot of sense. The cycle of the moon and how you have four quarters starting with the new moon. This is day one of the month. And then this is your first Shabbat, your second, your third, then back around to new moon again. How it is Yahuwah's clock. And all you have to do to know what day of the month it is, because you can't do this with the sun, you guys. You can't walk out any given day of the week. And look at the sun and tell me what day of the week it is. But you can go outside at night and based on where the moon is, know what day of the month it is. It's ingenious. And it's a part of Yahuwah's clock. And to suggest that the moon observation comes from Babylon is foolishness. Uh in subsequent years, the Jews went through iron and fire, and the Christian emperors forbade the Jewish computation of the calendar and did not allow the announcement of the feast days. And so the Jewish communities were left in utter doubt uh, concerning the most important religious decisions uh, as pertaining to their festivals. And so the immediate consequence was the fixation and calculation of the Hebrew calendar by Hillel II. So because of Constantine outlawing them to be able to keep their calendar, everything was in confusion. And so Hillel II started the fixing. Constantius, Pentius act impacted ap apostolic Christians as well. While Tertullian re reveals pagan Christians were already transferring their worship to the day of the sun, Christians becoming pagan, quote, declaring the new month by observation of the new moon and the new year by the arrival of spring can only be done by the Sanhedrin. In the time of Hillel II, the last president of the Sanhedrin, the Romans prohibited this practice. Hallel II was therefore forced to institute his fixed calendar, thus in effect giving the Sanhedrin's advice, advance approval to the calendars of all future years. As early as the second century, others clung to the true Sabbath for over a thousand years Almost 40 years after the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Laodicea, circa 363 to 364, released a statement demanding that Christians work on the Sabbath and abstain from work on the Lord's Day. This decree, translated in English, states, quote, Christians shall not Judaize and be idle on Sabbato, but shall work on that day but the Lord's day they shall especially honor, and as being Christians shall, if possible, do no work on. So what this is saying is they created another day called the Lord's day, and the Jews will no longer observe the Shabbat, but the Lord's day, which is Saturday or Sunday, that the Jews started doing Saturday and Constantine, Constant, uh, Constantinus instituted the Sunday worship. So that was the Lord's Day. Saturday was the Shabbat. Sunday was the Lord's Day. And they were not allowed to do work on the Lord's Day, but must work on the Shabbat. Right? That's what that's that's their Shabbat was Saturday. It it was just being changed at 322, around uh 322, 369 is constant. Uh, Tias, the son of Constantine. So this took it further. Uh, and I do believe this is when uh, the, the, the Jews decided and fixed the day Saturday. And it was different than the Lord's Day, which was the next day. 
on that day. If, however, they are found Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. Okay, so uh, Christians at the time of the calendar change were not confused which day was Saturday uh, and over Saturday being the Sabbath. Everyone knew that Dias Saturni had recently been moved from the first day of the pagan planetary week to the last day. While Sabato was the seventh day of the Jewish lunar solar calendar, which no one in power wished to be associated. So again, these were two different days on two distinct calendar systems, and everybody at that time knew about it. Just as Constantine was the power behind an action that ultimately led to the destruction of the biblical calendar for use by Christians, another man, a Jew, was responsible for, for a reaction that had consequences just as far-reaching. Prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, the high priest had been in charge of the calendar, while the Sanhedrin, that's the rabbinical supreme court, presided in Jerusalem, there was no set calendar. They would evalu evaluate every year to determine whether it should be declared a, a leap year. This task fell to the president of the Sanhedrin when the priesthood was no more. Quote, under the reign of Constantinus, 337 through 362, the persecutions of the Jews reached such a height that the computation of the calendar was forbidden under pain of severe punishment, end quote. This was a reaction. Uh, it was a reaction to this situation that Hillel II, president of the Sanhedrin, took the extraordinary step in 359 CE of modifying the ancient ca biblical calendar to allow the Jews more easily to more easily coexist with the Christians. So, okay, who is this Hillel too? We've all maybe heard about it. And if you know anybody that uh, does the Jewish calendar or the Hebrew calendar, uh, a lot of the Messianic groups too also go by the Hillel II calendar. So who is he? Uh, Hillel II was of the fifth generation of the land of Israel, and he held the office of Nasi, uh, the Sanhedrin between 320 and 385. So he was head of the Sanhedrin for uh, 65 years. And he is sometimes confused with Hillel the Elder, as the Talmud sometimes simply uses the name Hillel. So, uh, anyways, Hillel II, he is traditionally regarded as the creator of the modern fixed Jewish calendar. In the year that this event happened, 670 of the Seleucid era, which corresponds to 358 CE, or and 359 CE. When Hillel II fixed the calendar, he incorporated leap years on a permanent basis. It is possible, but not provable, that this particular cycle of leap years was used and understood prior to Hillel, as it follows the 19-year Metonic cycle. Hillel based his calendar, quote, on mathematical and astronomical calculations, that is, rather than observations. This calendar, still in use, standardized the length of months and the addition of months over the course of a 19-year cycle so that the lunar calendar aligns with the solar years. Now, do you understand what he, what he just saying there? Hillel had a problem with fixing the calendar because it disregarded the lunar. And so he had to come up with a mathematical formula, the 19-year metatonic cycle, to sync with the lunar cycle because it would get so far out of sync that your, your seasons would move. So this was the problem, you guys, with going in, and the problem they still have today. A uh, good example is Purim. When they decide to do Purim, this is, you guys, in, in the ninth chapter of, oh, my gosh. Hold on just a second. Esther. Esther 9. I was going to get a Bible out, but I won't. Esther 9. You can go and look there. As a as a decree that Yahuwah puts out that that they would would observe 
the 13th and 14th of Adar as a Shabbat. Well, if you guys, if the lunar solar calendar is true, and I believe it is, every 15th of the month is a Shabbat. So this means that in chapter 19, uh, chapter 9 of Esther, when, you, in, when Purim is instituted, and they are to observe the 13th and the 14th day, along with the 15th, which was already a Shabbat, you have a three-day Shabbat uh, cycle that is permanent. And so every year, the Jews have to sync this particular cycle to the fixed calendar. Because every year, every year, or every month, the 15th is the Shabbat. It is a Shabbat. It is a full moon Shabbat. And so if you have a, a Sabbath that moves, and the Hillel calendar does on Yahuwah's calendar, every year won't be the same. It would be the same every seven years. So how do you get it to hit the same every year? You have to do what's called intercalation. And that's what they do. That day for them on the Hillel calendar moves so that they can get that three-day feast in. So that's just a little side note on the problems with fixing the calendar to make it a Saturday, and that's exactly what happened, you guys. When Hillel fixed the calendar, instead of observing the Christian Sunday, they observed the day before, which was a Saturday, and that has stuck ever since, and it's been since around 360 years after Yeshua, meaning Yeshua and the disciples and all then in that time we're on a lunar, solar, agricultural calendar. He declared a 13th month to be intercalated in the 3rd, 6th, 8th, 11th, 14th, 17th, and the 19 years of the 19-year cycle. Okay, so, uh, but Hillel did more than make known a 19-year cycle of intercalculations that was in all probability used along. He also transferred the observance of the ancient Sabbath from the 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th days of the lunar month to every Saturday on, of the Julian month. This change necessitated still another, rules of postponement. Changing the weekly Sabbath from the lunar solar calendar to Sunday is clearly to Saturday is clearly implied by the need for rules of postponement, which prior to Hallel's fixing of the calendar had been unnecessary. According to the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia, the new moon is still, and the Sabbath original Sabbath really or Sabbath really was dependent on the lunar cycle. When both the Sabbath and the annual feast are calculated on the lunar solar calendar, rules of postponement are unnecessary. It is only when the yearly feasts are calculated by one calendar and the weekly Sabbath is calculated by another that there are conflicts requiring rules of postponement. Did you hear that? Zadok calendar observers, the lunar solar do not have to do that. That should be a red flag for you, that you got to manipulate and alter to make your days fit. And yes, you do. You just don't know it. You just come along and hear some teacher uh, from Arizona telling you that the Zadok calendar is the one and yet gives no, not one biblical truth to prove that. Just declaration. I'm not buying it. Show me biblical truth. You can't. You can't do it. Historically and biblically, you cannot show it. Yeah, and maybe if you're new to the Creator's calendar, you didn't know there were rules of postponement. But in the Father's calendar, it's not necessary. But in a man-made calendar, which Hillel too was a man, he man-made it the best he could, um, there has to be rules of postponement. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, I guess, uh, Brother, uh, if you'll read... 
And if you read right there, and then when it talks about each rule, I guess I can read the rule. Okay. Without the rules of postponement, the annual feast come into contact, conflict with Saturday. For example, if the Feast of Trumpets, New Moon, for the seventh month, were to fall on Sunday, the last day of Festival of Tabernacles would fall on a Saturday, conflicting with the traditional observance for the last day of the feast. Hence, the need for the first and second rules of postponement. Okay, the first rule is the Jewish New Year Feast of Trumpets may not fall on a Sunday, Wednesday, or Friday. And the second one is if the new moon, Moled, for the seventh month falls on a Sunday, Wednesday, or Friday, the new moon is postponed until the following day. The third rule of postponement ensures that the common year in question would no, not be longer than 355 days. Okay, the third one is if the Moled of the seventh month in a common year occurs on a Tuesday at 3.20.10.80 a.m. or later, the new moon is postponed until Thursday. The fourth rule of postponement guarantees that a common year following a leap year is to be uh, not shorter than 383 days. Okay, the fourth rule in a common year, I'm kind of repeating what you're saying, but I'm reading the actual rule. In a common year following a leap year, if the molet of the seventh month occurs after 9 a.m. Uh, and 589 slash 1080 parts, on a Monday morning, new moon is postponed until Tuesday. So, so can you imagine postponing Sabbath on the Father's calendar and postponing them onto Gregorian uh, weekdays? So that's what had to happen with the rules of postponement. Just want to make a point right here. The fourth rule of postponement postponement guarantees that a common year following a leap year is not shorter than 383 years. I did notice something with the observation of some of these on the Zadok calendar from year to year that their feast days are, you know, way more than a year. Your feast day should be the same every year. If you are going over that into more days than there is in the year, you are wrong, sir. Period. You cannot have 375 days in a year or 380 days in a year between your, your, your you know, two pen Pentecost or two um, Passovers or two Shavuot, I mean, uh, Sukkot. That should be a red flag. Are any of you counting your days on the Zadok calendar? I am. And you got more days than there should be in a year between your festivals. So this fixed calendar is highly regimented. There are exactly 14 different patterns that the Hebrew calendar years may take. The, excuse me, Hebrew calendar years may take. Distinguished by the length of the year and the day of the week, on which Rosh Hashanah falls. Because the rules are complex, a pattern can repeat itself several times in the course of a few years, and then not occur again for a long time. But the Jewish calendar is known to be extremely accurate. It does not lose or gain time as some of the other calendars do. And when it was talking about the Jewish calendar there, it's talking about the Father's calendar in the heavens that doesn't uh, uh, lose or gain time. Thank you, Barbara, for clearing that up. It should be, but the lunisolar calendar is not known uh, to, is known to be extremely accurate. It does not lose or gain time as other, some other count. That, I agree, she, she's made a, a, a good correction here. And that needs to be pointed out. We're not talking about Hillel's calendar here. 
We're talking about Yahuwah's calendar in the sky. Does not lose time or gain time. From, from my Passover to Passover is exactly one year. It's not 375 days. Remnant house. I'm as a man-made calendar. So uh, this was an act of survival by Hillel too, and it was made in response to the brutal persecutions of Constantine's son, Continius. And so with his own hand, the Patriarch destroyed the last bond which united the communities dispersed throughout the Roman and Persian empires with the Patriot shoot. I don't know how to say that. And so he was more concerned for the certainty of the continuance of Judaism than for the dignity of his own house and therefore abandoned those functions for which his ancestors had been so jealous and solicitous. And the members of the Sanhedrin favored this innovation. So uh, one man single-handedly kind of did away with the father's calendar and made a new calendar. Besides Constantine, uh, Hillel too did. Hillel too fixed the calendar. He, in his position as president of the Sanhedrin, effectively gave permission to the Jews to worship on Saturday for all future times. Please understand this. This is when the Saturday worship came. At this time, th almost 400 years after Yeshua. How can you tell me? And by the way, this is a Gregorian calendar at this point, not the Julian calendar that was instated by Rome when Yeshua was on the earth, which had eight days in a week. And Saturday was not the day you think it is. As it is today. How tell me how everybody was on a salary, a seven day continuous seven day Saturday calendar when there's eight days in a week? It does not work out. And this is why I can't get anybody to debate me on this Zadok calendar because it's foolishness and they know they can't defend it. I challenge anybody. Give me reasons in scripture that there is a Saturday observance. You can't do it. And this is why. Because Hillel was the one that decided this was the day. That's historical fact. And he has nothing to do with Babylon. <laughs> it was nowhere near Babylon. So today, nearly 1,700 years later, the action of Constantine and its resulting reaction by Hillel II are still impacting hundreds of millions of people around the world. And I'll let you read these, Brother Pete. Catholics worship on Sunday in honor of the resurrection. This is in accordance with with the act of Constantine, which changed the observance from the lunar solar calendar Passover to the pagan solar calculated Easter. So we're going to have five results of all the major religions that you know are resulted because of Constantine and Hillel too. Jews worship on Saturday because Talmudic law justifies the act of keeping one day in seven when one does not know when the true Sabbath falls. Let me just state here. This is a truth. There's a statute in the Talmud that says, if the rabbis decide something that they decide is better than what it says in the scriptures, guess what? Guess what they did? They gave themselves overriding power, sort of like the veto power of a president, to override the Bible. Shocker. That's what that's what this that's what the Talmud did. And does. Even to this day. Anytime there's something that conflicts the agenda of the rabbis, guess what they do? They come up with a new law. Sort of like what our government does. 
and they override the Bible. That's a problem, you guys. I got a problem with that. Most Protestants join with Catholics in worship on Sunday. The and by the way, the Catholics, all they did was come along and compound the problem even more with, with this in later for, for the Christian observances. They gave us Easter instead of Passover. There was no such thing as Easter, you guys. That is a pagan festival given to the church in place of the real thing, which is called Passover. And the same thing with Christmas. Christmas is not the birth of the Messiah. It has nothing to do with him. But yet, this is what was given to us by the Catholic Church, and the Protestants just took it with them, just like they took the Eucharist and called it the, 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 the <laughs> communion service. And yes, that is a Catholic ritual. We were, Yeshua was not instituting the Last Supper as taking away from him one. He was keeping, the he was teaching his disciples what the Passover meant. He was not instituting the Eucharist. That's a Catholic invention. We have to go back to our Father's heart and let go of all these man-made traditions, you guys. The first day of the modern Gregorian week, assuming it is the day of the resurrection. Saturday, Sabbath-keeping Protestants worship on Saturday because it is the seventh day of the modern week. And they assume that since the Jews worship on Saturday, it must be the biblical Sabbath. Muslims likewise honor the pagan papal Gregorian method of calculation by going to mosque for prayers on Friday. So it's affected everybody all these years later. So it is not possible to find a true Seventh-day Sabbath using a modern Gregorian calendar. Uh, the solar calendar is nothing more than a pagan method of time calculation and the early Julian calendar was established by pagans for pagans. And it was officially adopted for ecclesiastical use at the Council of Nicaea. It was later adjusted by Jesuit astronomer Christopher, Christopher uh, Clavi, Clavius at the behest of Pope Gregory the Ninth. Hence, no, excuse me, that's the 13th. Hence the name Gregorian calendar. Clavius confirmed that the Julian calendar, and thus the Gregorian calendar that comes from it, the Gregorian calendar was founded on paganism and has no connection whatsoever to the biblical calendar. So does the Seventh-day Sabbath of the Hebrew before Hillel 2 match up with your Saturday, and there's a big uh, screen here showing the, the Sunday through Saturday Gregorian uh, days, or uh, the calendar of the Father where the Sabbath is always the seventh day. So, or did the original Sabbath get shunted off somewhere down the week and forgotten, say at the Council of Nicaea? The, he, the ancient Hebrew seven-day calend, weekly calend, cadence from the Jewish calendar before Hillel II in the fourth century was always like work day was one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh day the Sabbath. And then there were, of course, the two days uh, at the end of the month, uh, transition and new moon day. But what happened at the Council of Nicaea with Rome was Saturday was fixed forever as the seventh day on a Gregorian calendar. None who decide, desire to worship the Creator on his Holy Sabbath will calculate their worship days by this domination, excuse me, by this abomination of desolation that dishonors Yahweh and desolates the soul. Only the lunisolar calendar of, of creation can pinpoint when the true Sabbath occurs. Lay aside the traditions of man, accept only the word of Yah, and worship him by his ordained me method of timekeeping. 
Okay, thank you, Brother Pete. And that's the end of this uh, little PowerPoint, this little study. And uh, this article is, is made by World's Last Chance, and I'll leave the link below. And I think I'll also put it up on our website, and it's How Two Men uh, Change the World. Let's see. Um, let me see if I can get to it. I've got it right here. Um, yeah, Constantine One and Hillel Two, Two Men Who Changed the Whole World. And that's where the article is from. And I've got all the links here. So, um, yeah, would, uh, did anybody have a comment or a uh, comment about the Hillel 2 calendar? Is that the first you've heard of it? Um, or um, anything about the rules of postponement? We'll leave the recording on for a little discussion. It amazes me that there's no new thing under the sun. We tend to cave in on our belief about Sabbath too often we as a whole population because it's inconvenient and we couldn't possibly make a living if blah 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 you know all those excuses we make the excuses the same excuses that the Jewish people in captivity made when they capitulated to their host country's date and so no wonder it is very strongly indicative of who you follow. Because if Baal be Baal, if Baal be God, then follow him. If God be God, follow him. Yahweh be Yah. So it's just amazing how we <laughs> we people tend to have the same clay feet. Okay, thank you, Susan. Yes, we do have to make a decision um, who we're going to worship, and the daily worship says who we're worshiping, doesn't it? So thank you. Um, we have another comment. I found it uh, uh, pretty interesting that about the council of, after Nicaea, the Laodicean, the Laodicean okay. council. Um, sure. And that uh, I forget that I think I'd heard it before, but it, it wasn't in my <laughs> immediate grab file folder because it points out that Christians at that time were keeping a lunar solar calendar and had to be basically outlawed by the church by severe penalty, whatever that might be. Yeah, and I saw, you know, there it said that some of the faithful people kept it for a thousand years, even after they could have severe penalty for keeping the Sabbath according to the signs in the heavens. Uh, there's probably going to be a time coming for us where there will be severe penalty for um, not going to church or whatever, getting your ticket stamped that you were there on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, the days that are worshipped in, here in America. Yes, it may be that as some of them did, we will have to flee to caves and hide out. Yes, we don't know. Thank you, Susan. Well, you know, the rules of postponement, of course, when I first found out about the Creator Sabbath, that was just way another chapter I didn't even think about. I didn't know that that was even took place. I, I mean, I was in the Messianic groups and kept the feast days for at least uh, 12 years before, and I didn't know they were switching around if trumpets landed on a Monday or if something else landed on a Tuesday or new moon day would change to Wednesday. I didn't know all that stuff was going on. And I don't think people know that is happening. They're just following the calendar they're given. I have a question um, on your slide, which talked about Hillel to changing the lunar calendar sabbath the 8th 15th 22nd 29th to saturday do you have a quote where that's stated yeah i have all these quotes below or maybe that might have been a quote from the ladies that wrote this article but he did by changing it to always being saturday that would be a fact she's right let me help her answer this that is a fact it was changed to saturday 
But here's where he deviated from. Exodus 16 tells us the days. And you, who it tells you in that text, if you look at it in context, he tells Moses he's going to test the people. He's going to give them the Sabbath. This is the first time you see Sabbath mentioned in the scriptures. It was not at creation, at the creation of the moon, that he gave us the Sabbath, people. It was Exodus 16. It's the first time the word Sabbath is used. And Yahuwah gives it to the people with a work week. He says, you're going to gather for six days. And on the sixth day, you're going to gather twice as much and rest on the seventh day. If you look at what days that is, because they got there on the 15th and they rested. And Yahuwah has this conversation with Moses that evening. They get 15th. They get quail in the evening. And the morning of the 16th, the very first day of the first work week ever given to them. Day 16 is the first day. If you count that, the very first Shabbat on record for them, even though Yahuwah had them on, their, on the Shabbat already anyway, starting with Passover, is the 22nd day of the month. You have those two days now in stone. And mathematically, you can work forwards and backwards and discover, oh my gosh. So that means the Shabbat days are the 8th, the 15th, the 22 and the 29th day of the month. And the reason is because you have a new moon day. And I just got in a discussion with somebody with this. And he's like, why is the, is the Shabbat on the eighth day? It's the eighth day of the month. But it's the seventh day of the week. Because your weekly count is different than your monthly count. That's why. That's the easy explanation. So that is where they deviated from. For the for the uh, person asking the question that that Hillel, it's not quoted that he changed it from. We just know from Exodus 16 that the biblical calendar, as stated by one chapter, and all I need is one chapter of the Bible to prove the days of the Shabbat. But it just so happens that we can prove seven months of this in all of the scriptures, and they're always the eight, fifteen, twenty-two, and twenty-nine every time. Show me on a Zadar calendar any month with consecutive months following where you got 8, 15, 22, and 29 of the month as the Shabbat. You cannot do it. And I can offer all the money in the world and nobody could claim it. Nobody could call my bluff on it. Because it's the truth. It's biblical truth. That he changed it from the 8, 15, 22nd, 29th because he was saying it will always be on a Gregorian Saturday, regardless of the date, is actually what was happening. And I don't know if that was a direct quote, quote Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And let me just take it a little further, because I know some people want to want to cite Jubilee 6, where it talks about how if you don't observe the new moons correctly, if you do, if you, well, let me just back up. The proponents of a lunar solar cal calendar believe that it's saying that if you observe the new moons, that you're going to end up with 10 extra days on your calendar. That is not so. If you don't observe the new moons, you will end up with 10 extra days on your calendar. That's why I just said earlier that between um, Passover to Passover or Sukkot to Sukkot or Shavuot to Shavuot on the, on the calendar that remnant house is on <clears throat> there's 375 days how many extra days of the year is that tell me how many extra days is that is it 10 so are we taking what it says in jubilees out of context because we don't understand the solar lunar calendar i would i would agree so yes that's that's the fact and so you sound foolish when you cite to me that I'm going to be off 10 days on my calendar because I keep the, the new moon. What's ironic is exactly what's happening to you. It doesn't happen to the lunar solar people because we're marking the month with the clock. That's what's happening. It might have just been a summation of what happened because of the change. Uh-huh. Thank you. Anybody else before we close the recording today?
Okay, well, I hope everybody at chair will stay and we can have a conversation and questions and if newcomers have anything they'd like to ask, we'll save time for them. So I'm going to say uh, Shabbat Shalom. We'll be back next week and uh, thank you everybody for being here and helping with uh, being present, your presence on the line and uh, Brother Pete for reading and for Susan and Charlotte and the comments and for each one. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Barbara and Brother Peter, Sister Barbara, Brother Peter, for this informative teaching. Um, I love how they put in all the graphics. It's a little easier for those of us who have ADD uh, to kind of follow along, right? I'm a visual. I have to see these things, but I'm a little bit lazy, too, and I don't put them always in my videos. So I appreciate that in the uh, the other YouTube creators that are putting this information out. And again, I apologize that I'm not able to be on par with this teaching with my own stuff. Um, I am busy right now. I'm, I'm back in the bees. Uh, I got two acre areas going with hives and both. And uh, I've been busy every day uh, working with that and doing other things. I'm also working on codes, you guys. I'm committed to that. I got like 40 something names left on my uh, personal codes, but yet I'm also working on codes about the calendar. Um, and I know that disappoints some of you want me to do codes on current events and, you know, things like many subs going down in the Titanic and all of that, yada, yada, yada and stuff. You guys, you would doesn't have me focused on things like that right now. Um, it's, it's really no need. What details do you need about things like that? Just trivial things. You always put it on my heart that this is critical. Understanding the Shabbat. If he tells you in his scripture that it's going to be a sign between you and me to the world that you're mine, is that you keep my Shabbat. Don't you know he's speaking about the correct Shabbat and not just something that you were given in a faint if the scripture says where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there also. Does it now make sense why the enemy want to change the name of the Most High and of the Son? Does it make a little sense now? If he tells you in the scriptures that if you keep his Shabbats and if you keep his feast, he's going to open up the windows of heavens on those days and pour out a blessing to you. Wouldn't you think the enemy would want to do something about that? So it's not so crazy that I'm presenting this to you, you guys. The problem is with many is cognitive dissonance. What we believe and hold to what we believe is true, and that comes under attack with actual truth, it can cause a reaction that's not always good. And I get it. I even see division and people fighting on every topic. You guys, flat earth, round earth. You know, Saturday, Shabbat, Solar Lunar, Zadok, whatever, divisions happen. And that's the enemy. If we expect that what happens in Acts 2 to happen again, it's going to be in unity, you guys. We've got to get unity. And I believe that unity is going to come on his Shabbats, on his feast, and on his name. There's a reason why he said in Malachi 3 that the ones that are talking about my name, Make note. He told the angels, make note of them, put them in the name of the, the, the book of remembrance, write your names there, because these people are going to be the diadem, the jewels in my diadem. That's important, and that's a place you want to be. But these are the very same ones that keep his law and keep his Shabbat. I guarantee you. Shalom to you. May you will bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. We'll see you in the next video.